Hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you please can yeah. mute yourself so that we can fully hear the speakers today. I'm also going to help out with muting just to make sure we can all hear each other. Okay, um, I think I want to wait just one more minute just to make sure everyone logs on and then we can start. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our first ever world tour event where each month we will cover climate action in different countries. My name is Ashley Miki and I am the Youth Ambassador Board Member for the Foundation for Climate Restoration. The foundation has a mission of catalyzing action by 2030 to restore our earth to pre-industrial levels of carbon by 2050. So to give a better visual of what this all means, we have a bathtub video that shows you the three branches of climate action and where climate restoration fits in. Imagine our Earth is in a bathtub. For millions of years, Earth was bathing in a healthy level of CO2. Over the last 200 years, humankind turned on the faucet pouring additional CO2 into the bathtub. Today, the tub is overflowing and our planet is drowning in CO2. Mitigation helps to turn down the flow rate of the faucet and adaptation helps us learn to swim in the tub. Both are critical. Still, no matter how much we turn down that faucet, our planet will still be drowning unless we get some CO2 out of the tub. Climate restoration opens the drain to empty the tub. At the Foundation for Climate Restoration, our mission is to restore CO2 to healthy levels as quickly as possible. Our goal is to get to pre-industrial levels by the year 2050. This is achievable, but we need to hurry. Join us. Awesome. So under the foundation, we have launched our Youth Leaders for Climate Restoration program just this year. And today you'll be hearing from our youth in cohort one. The program has already reached 19 countries from across the world in countries like Fiji, Liberia, Nigeria, India, and the United States. Today, our world tour will talk about climate action in the country of Liberia. So first up, we have our youth leader, Ezekiel Nanfor, and he will give you an introduction to our featured country. Oh, Ezekiel, you're muted. Hi, everyone. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Ezekiel Yanfor, and I'm from Liberia, West Africa. I'm a climate activist. Liberia is a country that lies along the coast of West Africa. And uh, if you look on the map of, of Liberia and the map of Africa, you are seeing uh, in the, on the map of Africa, the country that is marked with the right is, is Liberia. And if you look at the map of Liberia, you will find out that we have three countries. We have Sierra Leone, we have Guinea, and we have Ivory Coast. Uh, Sierra Leone lies on the northwest of Liberia, Guinea also to the north. We also have Cote d'Ivoire to the east, and we have the Atlantic Ocean to the south and west of Liberia. And Liberia's population, according to statistics gathered in 2020, our population is currently at 4,491,000. And out of that population, 65% constitute the young people. And our population, we have some of our population in the urban area and the other in the rural part of Liberia. According to, according to statistics, 
in 2016, we have about 53.9% of our population in the urban area, and we have 46.1% of our population living in the rural area. And Labrador have a total area of 38,491 square miles. And Liberia is also the only country, the only black nation in Africa that was not colonized by any country. And Liberia got independent in July 26, 1847. In 2005, former president Edin Johnson Salif became the first female African head of state in Africa. And she began our president after our civil war ended. And we also have our current president, who is a soccer, former soccer legend and one of the iconic stars in the world, that is President George Manawiya, is our current president. And we are going to play a video to officially introduce you to Liberia. So just enjoy the video and see how beautiful Liberia is. Thank you. Experience our beaches. Thank you very much and we say thank you and welcome to Liberia. Now I'm going to go through the climate situation in Liberia. So in Liberia, we have two seasons. We have the dry season and the rainy season. The dry season, start from November to April, and we have our rainy season starting from May to October. And uh, deforestation and drought in the Sahel 
have affected the climate of Liberia. And um, our plants and animals are very much beautiful. And we, we have about 43% of the remaining guinea half forest in our country, Liberia. And the Sapo National Park of Liberia was established in 1983 to conserve to conserve our wildlife. And this, this park, like, like you are seeing on the screen, holds almost all our animals. We have a lot of uh, animals, like plants, we have jepansi, we have uh, rabbits, we have all kinds of animals within our park. And in 2020, Liberia extended our conservation uh, we established the Gola National Forest Reserve. We went on to establish the Wodobisi National Forest, the Kizo, to reserve our forest. And I'm going to show you some of Liberia like, beautiful wildlife in the, in, in the video that will be played so that you can see how some of the animals and some of those wildlife in our country. Agricultural fisheries and forests are instrumental to Liberia development. But our high reliance on climate sensitive activities run out our country, Liberia, vulnerable to climate change. And uh, agriculture is the most vulnerable sector in Liberia, followed by the salt, the salt water, the fresh water. They are, these are key economic. And, and nutritional resources are likely to suffer as we have uh, the temperature rise and the coastal ecosystem damage. And Labrador GHG, that is our greenhouse gas emission. That sector, Labrador's initial national communication that was sent to the UNFCCC, that is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change talks about Labrador's greenhouse gas emission. The RNC identifies energy as the leading source of Labrador greenhouse gas emission, constituting about 5.4 metric tons of CO2 emission, followed by the agricultural sector, which is 2.6 metric tons CO2 emission, and the waste sector that is 0.5 metric tons CO2 emission. So all these sectors contribute immensely to the changing climate in Liberia. And there are serious impact that will be caused to Liberia's sector. And some of those impact like the agricultural sector, when we have the climate changing, this sector will be immensely impact when we will see a decrease in the production of our crops. And we'll also find out that our lands will not be fatter as it used to be. We also see that our season pattern will change. Currently in Liberia, we are in the, we are in the dry season. That is when the sun is shining, but now we are experiencing heavy rainfall. So these, these uh, changes in our climate will impact our agricultural sector immensely. Our water resource also will be damaged. Uh, we will not have quality drinking water when these changes in our 
you know, our, our temperature having to rise. And like you saw on, on the, uh, the picture, the map of Liberia, Liberia lies along the, along the coast of West Africa. So when the climate changes, we'll find out that the coastal belt of Liberia, the sea level will rise. And when the sea level rise, we have lots of Liberia infrastructures. We have our executive mansion. We have all our banks. We have most of our executive buildings in Liberia. And 1.2 million of our population lies in the capital city of Liberia. And that is Morovia along the west coast of Africa. So when this happened, we'll find out that this thing will take place. So the future risk in the health sector will also be damaged. And when our health sector happened to be affected, we have emerging diseases taking place. So thank you very much for having me. I'm so happy for this water. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ezekiel, for that excellent introduction on the climate situation in Liberia. And now we're going to have our youth leader, Catherine Cano, and she will cover mitigation adaptation. But she will cover mitigation and adaptation efforts in Liberia, as well as effects on people, infrastructure, infrastructure, and wildlife. Thank you for the introduction, Ashley. I'm Catherine. I'm from Colombia. And before I start, I want to show you this quick video. It's about the different challenges that Liberia is facing right now. Thank you. Whoa. The country is now threatened by widespread abuse of the environment, unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, and by the consequences of climate change. This is manifested in the rapid rates of deforestation, environmental degradation, and rapid erosion. To date, more than 50% of the forests have been destroyed. Additionally, many illicit activities in protected areas still currently jeopardize the forest's conservation and threaten the lives of parks authorities and forest rangers. The main driver of deforestation includes population pressure due to the use of biological resources for food, shelter and energy. Farming and agriculture practices, especially palm oil culture, in association with poaching, hunting and unregulated timber extraction, continue to threaten biodiversity. Bong bong kefe fe mese kuma kuma be amu ta ke no ko baba mu no be mu ya bonu te mu na mu ma ke men no nya na no wa when like thank you so uh now to give you more context uh these are other climate related red flags that are affecting the ecosystem services in Liberia so as Ezekiel said, it's predicted that climate change is going to increase the wet and the dry seasons. So this is going to negatively impact rice cultivation and livestock. And when you realize that agriculture, it's a critical industry because 70% of its population depends on it, you can see that it seems like a major threat. Next slide, please. Also, um, significant infrastructure is at risk from sea level rise. In this picture, you can see Monrovia, the capital city of Liberia. And Liberia is characterized by having a highly populated coastline, as you can see. And it means that they are exposed to natural hazards and climate related risks like floods, windstorms, wildfires, and as I mentioned, coastal erosion. Next slide, please. Now, regarding the health security, um, for health, climate change may lead to increase cases of malaria, cholera, and their real diseases. And this is also related with the water pollution of Liberia, because even though they have a lot of water resources, only 90% of its population it, uh, has limited access to safe drinking water. And this is because of the coliform contamination that is the main water quality issue. So 
addressing E. coli contamination with ongoing efforts of water treatment is needed. Uh, now I'm going to show you some infographic. This is a timeline and it shows like a little recap of the different mitigation and adaptation efforts that Liberia is, it's been making through the past few years. So in 2008, they created the National Adaptation Program, as you can see here in this first section. Um, and it was Liberia first climate change initiative and it contains a set of systematic adaptation actions. For example, its main goals are first coastal development and management, then agriculture, energy, forest management and coastal resilience. And finally, they want to address as well health and waste management. Until 2016, they received a green climate funding. Uh, they received $2.2 million uh, with the UNDP, the United Nations, acting as its delivery. So in 2008, the government and the partners launched the National Adaptation Plan of Liberia. During this year, they started to implement the different actions. For example, in June of 2008, they started a training on national disaster readiness to help citizens understand the steps to be adopted to respond to various disaster solutions. In July, the UNDP equips the Environmental Protection Agency for environmental monitoring and data collection. This is really important because it's like the scientific basis in order to make accurate decisions. Also during this month, Liberia ratifies the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And this is a really important milestone because, uh, well, to foster low carbon climate resilient development. Now, during the months of August and October, they kept uh, implementing different trainings. And as well in August, Liberia launched the National Police and Response Strategy on Climate Change. And in October, uh, they launched the National Disaster Risk Assessment. In the year of 2019, uh, months before all this COVID situation, they inaugurated a School of Environment Environmental Studies and Climate Change, and it was inaugurated at the University of Liberia. So this was like a little recap, as I said, of the different mitigation and adaptation efforts that Liberia is making. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine, for covering mitigation and adaptation efforts in the effects of climate change. Now we're going to have our youth leader, Claire Markowitz, and she will cover the best practices for climate restoration and carbon removal policies. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Claire and I'm from San Rafael, California. So Liberia is committed to increasing access to clean green energy, not only across their own nation, but also globally by investing in sustainable agriculture techniques and education while supporting infrastructure development across the country. Liberia sees the connection between healthy families and healthy communities to a healthy state and a healthy planet. That is why Liberia has pledged to follow their intended nationally determined contribution, also known as an INDC. Nationally determined contributions are efforts from each country in the Paris Climate Agreement to reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases and to adapt to the negative effects of climate change. However, Liberia's intended nationally determined contribution is not an international obligation, rather a way for them to interweave their low carbon development strategy into Liberia's longer term sustainability goals with their vision by 2030. Their vision by 2030 is an initiative working to change the country from a low income to a middle income country. Some legislation that Liberia has pledged to follow, as people has mentioned before, include that they ratify the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, also known as the UNFCCC, with their goals to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions in 1992. Liberia signed the Kyoto Protocol in 2002 that is a legally binding commitment to reduce 5.2% of greenhouse gas emissions below the 1990 levels. In 2008, Liberia committed to the National Adaptation Program of Action, where they, along with other less developed countries, outlined and identified their most urgent and important needs in regards to climate change adaptation. 
By 2012, Liberia submitted their initial national communication to the UNFCCC. And currently, Liberia is working on a national adaptation plan, also known as an NAP, and a national climate change policy. They are also working on enacting and a reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, also known as a Red Plus policy, along with creating some readiness activities. Globally, Liberia accounts for 0% of the total global emissions because their emissions of account for about 1.89 megatons of carbon dioxide. In comparison, from 1850 to 2011, the United States accounted for 27% of all global emissions, and the whole European Union put together accounted for about 25% of all global emissions. Although Liberia isn't contributing significant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and actually when land use change and forestry are considered, they're considered a carbon sink, Liberia's carbon emissions are projected to rise with global trends, leaving the country very vulnerable to even the smallest changes due to their high dependency on agriculture. Besides from importing infrastructure, improving infrastructure and stability, by improving on green and clean strategies, Liberia can gain a net benefit of $36.7 million per year, and their average low carbon strategies will save about 11.7 million metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. Liberia is committed to doing more to help and has the natural resources to do so, but needs financial support from more developed countries. Liberia is one of the least developed countries, but has about 30% of its land covered with trees and forests. And Liberia is home to 40% of West Africa's moist forests. In regards to mitigation efforts, Liberia aims to be carbon neutral by 2050. They have identified that their energy sector is the highest contributor to their greenhouse gas emissions, even though a very small percent of their population has access to energy and electricity. This high emission rate is due to the country's reliance on firewood, charcoal, palm oil, and fossil fuels. Liberia's initial national communication in 2013 built upon their national energy policy of 2009. This policy is working to maximize efficiency while minimizing costs and negative environmental impacts while providing people across the country with energy. Liberia hopes to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions by 10% by 2030 while improving their country's energy efficiency 20% by 2030 as well. In addition, Liberia aims to enhance their shares of renewable energy to the public by 30% of specific electricity availability and 10% of their total energy consumption by 2030. One way that Liberia suggests to make these initiatives a reality is by replacing cooking stoves that have lower thermal efficiency, therefore wasting more energy with higher efficiency stoves across the country. Liberia is seriously at risk from the negative and destructive effects of climate change, like droughts, flood, irregular rain, and frequent heat waves. This is because Liberia relies a lot on agriculture that is very sensitive to these changes in the climate. If crop yields decrease due to some or all of these factors, then it can increase food scarcity across the country. Another main factor that can affect Liberia is coastal erosion and sea level rise, as it is a major cities are centers for economic trade and they're often on the coastlines. The three main areas that Liberia is focusing on with adaptation are agriculture, monitoring systems, and coastal defense. With agriculture, Liberia wants to focus on strengthening resilience to increasing rainfall variability that climate change can bring and the diversification of crops planted and cultivated in Liberia. Some ways that they are doing this is through the increase in drought resistant and flood tolerant plants, as well as early maturing crop species. They also want to improve irrigation efficiency and the availability of climate resilient and indigenous food crops. The second way that they want to strengthen adaptation efforts and is through monitoring systems and measurements to measure the impact of climate change on the country. The third main way that they're implementing adaptation strategies is through the development of coastal defense zones. 
One idea that Liberia has to limit the effects of sea level rise is building walls along the coast to reduce their vulnerability. They also want to implement a coastal zone policy where they can outline strategies and management plans. Another way that they can naturally protect their coastal zones is by increasing mangrove ecosystems. As far as some restoration strategies, Liberia has a ton of potential by being classified as a global hotspot for biodiversity. Biodiversity hotspots must have at least 1,500 vascular and endemic plants, meaning that a large number of their plants are unique to their particular area. And it must have 30% or less of its natural vegetation. Adding on, less than 5% of Liberia's forests have no indication of human activity, also known as primary forests, but the rest are regenerative forests. This means that they have native species, but some indication of human activity. There are also only two protected areas in Liberia, being the Sapo National Park and the East Nimbia Nature Reserve, along with only eight forest reserves. This is because conservation competes with mining and logging that make up a significant percent of Liberia's exporting income. Protecting trees and forests is one of the easiest ways that Liberia can improve on their goal to be carbon neutral by 2050 and achieve being carbon negative. Trees sequester carbon through their natural processes known as photosynthesis. To get energy and nutrients to the plant, heat from the sun can turn carbon dioxide and water into food for the plant and oxygen. Another benefit to this strategy is that trees naturally filter and purify out air by releasing clean oxygen into the atmosphere, benefiting us too. Thank you so much for listening to my section of this presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire, for covering Liberia's carbon removal policies. And now we are going to have our youth leader, Elsie Jacobson, and she is going to cover legislation and agreements pertaining to mitigation, adaptation, and restoration. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ashley, for that introduction. Within the past 10 years, Liberia has recently enacted many different climate restoration methods and platforms. In 2013 and 2016, Liberia drafted two large reports to identify and assess some of the largest climate risks to the country and how they can be addressed. Then in 2014, Liberia was one of the first recipients of the Green Climate Fund, a fund established by the UN that financially helps assist the development of adaptation and mitigation practices to counter climate change. The country received this fund from Norway specifically to address unsustainable forestry practices, fossil fuel subsidies, and help promote a more renewable energy in the country. In August 2018, Liberia passed a national policy and response strategy on climate change. The legislature is a 95-page outline of what steps the country must take to help avoid the adverse consequences of climate change. It details how each industry in Liberia will be affected and each one must change to avoid the dangers of the warming of the globe. For example, Liberia established that it will work to protect and restore the mangrove ecosystem, as they are identified to play a very important role in protecting marine aquatic life, and therefore their health directly affects the fishing industry and furthermore the health of the economy. The act was passed with six main goals in mind. The first goal was to protect was to focus on enhancing the country's potential to increase carbon sequestration through conservation, forest management, forestry, and curbing deforestation. The second goal of the legislature was to encourage lowland farming by investing in small agriculture that will help avoid degrading land. Thirdly, the law proposed that all citizens should have access to affordable, sustainable, and low carbon energy services while the fourth goal was to enforce the mining sector to develop a low emission energy sector. The last two goals stated that the country should help implement a low carbon transportation sector and encourage energy recovery from waste. Some other more specific goals of the act included establishing a monitoring system for forest resources, implementing reforestation, setting up seed, blank, seed banks to collect crops, climate proofing infrastructure such as roads and sewers, and introducing a sustainable use of biomass. 
Additionally, Liberia also submitted its first voluntary national review in 2020, which is where the country assesses and presents its progress on its global goals. So Liberia as of 2002 is one party within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, as well as the Kyoto Protocol. And this is how it was able to obtain the green fund funding from the UN in 2014. The UNFCCC is a convention of 197 countries, originally created in 1994 with the goal of stabilizing greenhouse gases, gas concentration at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference. Liberia also signed the Doha Amendment in 2015, which established the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 18% compared to the 1990 levels of the participating countries. Lastly, Liberia signed the Paris Climate Change Agreement in 2016, which is the most comprehensive and international climate change agreement to date. It states humans must limit global warming to for two, ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. By 2020, countries needed to have submitted their plans for climate action, also known as nationally determined contributions, which show their actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In its mitigation sector of the NDC, Liberia is focusing on limiting traditional fossil fuels, such as firewood, charcoal, palm oil, and fossil fuels, with the use of more renewable energy sources. Specifically, Liberia reduced greenhouse gases by 10% in 2020, and improved and its goal is to improve energy efficiency by 20% in 2030. In terms of adaptation, Liberia is focusing on three sectors, agriculture, building hydrometeorologic monitoring systems, and building a wall of coastal defense to reduce vulnerable areas. The EPA is preparing Liberia's second national communications as of the UNCCC, which has five separate parts. Those parts include a description of national circumstances with greenhouse gases, integrating a vulnerable and adaptation assessment of the impacts of climate change, supporting the elaboration of climate ad adaptation, and lastly, socializing climate mitigation and adaptation. Thank you everyone for listening. And that is my end of this, my section. Awesome, thank you so much, LOC, for covering legislation related to climate action. Just a quick reminder to everyone attending, we will have time for a question and answer at the end. Our formal presentation ends at 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. However, after our presentation, we will have time to answer any questions that you may have. So if you think of anything, feel free to hold on to those at the end of our presentation and you'll be able to engage with us. Um, but as of right now, we will have our youth leader, um, Jonathan Jolly, and he will cover climate change efforts in relation and in context to social justice. Thank you for this wonderful introduction, Ashley. My name is Jonathan Jolly. I am from Nigeria, West Africa. I'm going to be covering a segment of this World Tower event, which is about how climate change affects groups of people differently in Liberia. Now, this has three compositions. We're going to be talking about Liberia, then how climate change affects women, children, and youth. And we're going to be looking again at how it affects the flora and fauna, the biodiversity. To begin with, in Liberia, because of low levels of adaptive capacity in different sectors, emanated from low levels of human and institutional capacity, technology, infrastructure, economy, etc., the impact exerted by climate change is severe. These sectors are identified as priority sectors. They include economic sectors, forestry and wildlife, agriculture, coastal area, water, fishery, energy, mining, industry, transport and tourism, infrastructure, urbanization, social sector, health and settlement. For instance, in forest dependent communities, 
Climate change induced extreme events are limiting the ability of communities to meet their basic requirements for food due to a reduction in the amount of productive land and pest infestation of crops. Lack of access to clean water, medicinal products, and fuel wood, among other things, which they get from the forest. Now, the disruption to the agricultural system resulting to climate change induced changes in patterns of rainfall. Temperature as well has direct consequences for the country, where more than 70% of Republic of Liberia of the population engage in agriculture as their main livelihood activity. With rice, which is the nation's staple, covering a majority of the area under production, rubber and cassava coming at the second and third place respectively. Now we're going to be looking again as the, at the climate change and women. According to Kamo, women, children, and youth are captured as the most vulnerable groups to the effects of climate change and gender equally has a critical role to play in the proposed pro poor agenda for prosperity and development of the government of Liberia. Women are dominant users of natural resources. Of course, these are lands and water. At the household level in Liberia, hence any impact of climate change is going to impact on them significantly. We must therefore ensure that climate change, climate restoration and climate adaptation planning in Liberia addresses the gender imbalance between women and men, boys and girls, etc. This was pointed by the UNFCC focal point for Liberia. We got, again, intense precipitation could affect the water infrastructure, which could also lead to an increase in the amount of runoff into rivers and lakes. Washing sediment, nutrients, pollutants, trash, animal waste, and other materials into water supplies. Sea level rise also induced flooding in Liberia is also an obvious immediate threat to economic growth by affecting energy supply, disrupting roads and transport, infrastructure, as well as settlement as the case was in 2007 and 2009. This was stated by USDA 2013. It also affects food and agricultural activities, education, health, water and sanitation and social protection. For example, it is projected that about 95 kilometers square of land in the coastal zone of Liberia will be inundated as a result of one meter sea level rise with about 50%, which is 48 kilometers square of the total land loss due to inundation being the sheltered coast with inundation followed by shoreline return. This was pointed by Wales 2005. Now, in the biodiversity, the flora and fauna, how climate change affects. Current estimates of flora and fauna show that there are over 2,000 species of flowering plants in Liberia, of which 240 are valuable timber trees. The fauna also consists of 125 species of reptiles and other amphibians as well as one, more than 1,000 insect species. There are multiple species of birds and mammals, such as hawks, eagles, rats, monkeys, leopards, elephants, and etc. The southeastern region of Liberia has the largest forest park, the Cranbasa National Forest, which covers an area of about 513 1,969 hectare, or 37.1% of the area of all the national parks combined. Now, the overall size of the 10 national forest parks in Liberia, the southeast, is about 66,969 hectare. Now, of these 10 parks, five are located in Lofa County, two in Grand Gede County, and three in Nimba County. In conclusion, the adverse effect of climate change has been exerting pressure on energy accessibility and efficiency. 
industrial activity, transport infrastructure, wildlife, tourism, health and settlement, and urbanization. Hence, the need for everyone to join hands to restore the climate back to pre-industrial levels. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for covering how social justice is involved in this fight for climate action. And lastly, we, lastly, we have our youth leader, Jesse Plank, that will come on and cover any practices and policies that are used to fight climate change in relation to jo social justice reform. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate the introduction. Um, so yes, as she talked about, uh, my name is Jesse Plank and I am a youth advocate for the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Um, and I will now be discussing Liberia's efforts in the context of social justice um, and their efforts to combat climate change um, in relation to social justice. But so many times when the conversation surrounding the effects of climate change is brought up, most dialogues begin with a discussion focused around the increased number of drastic weather events, the melting ice caps, the changing of ecosystems and you know other more tangible occurrences of the likes. However, time and time again, the effects on people and greater communities are left out of these conversations. As you all heard from Jonathan, Liberia is experiencing a vast number of different issues as a result of climate change, which is having a tangible impact on almost all aspects of Liberia's society. Many look to Liberia's government for support, and while they have begun focusing their efforts on combating this matter from a social standpoint, the coastal nation has a long journey ahead on the path towards fully helping its people live under this global issue. As discussed earlier by a few of the speakers, around three years ago, Liberia began tremendously concentrating their resources on fighting the effects of climate change with the launching of its national policy and response strategy on climate change. The plan is an all encompassing effort to move the country in the right direction, tackling the near futures problems across almost all sectors. And while most of these policies have secondhand social benefits by directing more funds to the country's infrastructure, agriculture industry, their fisheries and other important sectors of the likes, some were directly created with the people's greater social welfare in mind. For example, within the legislation under the energy policy standpoint, the strategy aims to move Liberia's economy and social sectors away from carbon emitting outlets towards a future of obtaining energy from greener, renewable sources. The country projects that this divergence towards an environmentally friendly future will establish universal access to affordable and sustainable modern energy sources, which would greatly improve the country's social welfare. In a separate section of the national policy, the legislation details the expansion of Liberia's healthcare system. In the face of an issue like climate change, the health of a nation's people is imperative to sustaining the long road ahead in combating this global problem. As such, under this new policy, Liberia plans to greatly expand and strengthen the country's health infrastructure and systems in order to benefit all people of the coastal nation land. Additionally, along with this policy, Liberia received a grant from the United Nations Green Climate Fund to establish an environmental science graduate program at the University of Liberia. This program aims to address the complexities of environmental, pro environmental problems by developing the future leaders and activists of Liberia so that they too can help the nation in the fight against climate change. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Jesse, for covering the policies that address social justice reform. In closing, um, I hope you enjoyed our event today and loved hearing from all of our amazing youth leaders in cohort one. As you can see in the chat, I sent you all, all the sources and links to the content in today's presentation. So if you want any more information, you can go ahead and take a look at that. Um, there are also several ways to stay engaged with the foundation and with our youth program. So you can head to the foundation's website and take the pledge for climate restoration and engage with the foundation's multiple initiatives like our solutions exchange, carbon removal task force, and local government campaign. Also look out for more exciting programming that we have and will begin during Earth Week in preparation for COP26. And lastly, invite any youth that you know to apply to our youth program. Applications for cohort three closes on April 3rd. And I am actually going to send the link in the chat to our applications, just in case you want to invite anyone to our youth program for cohort three. Um, and stay tuned each month as we feature a different country in our world tour series. 
So now we have time for a Q&A. If you all have any questions, um, our panelists and I would love to answer any questions, comments, or concerns that you have. We have the Q&A function enabled on our um, webinar so that you can submit any comments or questions or anything like that. Um, so if you have any feedback, we'd like to hear any of that now. And we'll also give you a few, <clears throat> we'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and type out any comments or feedback. Also, Ashley, if you would like, I can uh, make it so the attendees are uh, can become panelists and allow them to interact with us, if that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Uh, we also already have one question in the chat. It says, how do Liberia's climate policies compare to other countries in the region? Are they leading the way or lagging behind? Does anybody want to answer that? Yes, thank you. Um, as for Liberia, Specifically, I cannot say that Liberia is leading the way, but what I can say is that Liberia is not lagging behind. Liberia is on path with all of regional countries. Like you have more speakers, we just, uh, Liberia just received 17, 17 million plus for our coastal defense pro uh, project. That is to build, to build a coastal resilience. And you also heard that we established the School of Environmental Studies and Climate Change to impact young people. So in a few years from now, we'll have experts and specialists in the field of environmental studies and climate change. So that means that Liberia is on par with all the countries, but sincerely speaking, Liberia is not lagging behind. We are, we are moving ahead as well to meet our target. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that question. If anyone else has any other questions, comments, or concerns, again, feel free to use the Q&A function. And I think Brooke allowed you all to take yourself off mute or interact with us. Um, if they raise their hand, if anybody would like to ask a question live, if you raise your hand, um, I will be able to allow you to speak and engage with us. Uh, we also have another typed question in the Q&A function that says, would transitioning Liberia's energy to all renewable sources be enough to make them carbon neutral? And I think, Jesse, you had your hand up. Do you want to answer this question? Go for it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Definitely a um, good one. So as I sort of talked about, they have started, started um, transitioning or pledging to um, turn all the resources, all their energy sources to renewable resources. Um, and this wouldn't entirely necessarily, this alone make them entirely carbon neutral, uh, but it gets them on their way, it gets them on their way. There's a lot of things that go into making a country or a nation entirely carbon neutral because carbon is emitted from a lot of different sources. Um, it's not simply from their energy. So for instance, their agriculture policies or their transportation or any other sort of these sectors, um, not necessarily alone with energy, also contribute to the overall carbon emissions of a country. Um, and so in short, I guess they would need to do a lot of different things, which they're on their path already um, with these different policies that we talked about, um, but they're definitely on their way, yes. Thank you, Jesse. Would anybody else like to add to that? If not, there's some more questions that I can ask. Okay, uh, so next question is, is Liberia looking to expand its forests or just to protect existing forests? Awesome. I think Claire has her hand up for yeah. that one. Go, go for it, Claire. And um, whoever was, oh, Ezekiel, you can go after Claire. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, about 40% of Liberia's country is covered in trees, so they already do have a lot of trees. So I think their first step would be protecting those from like some illegal activities like Catherine mentioned in her video. I think that would be their first step. And then after that, maybe transitioning to expanding, but they do already have a bunch of abundant natural resources that are ready for them to use. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Kai. As well that uh, Labura also sang the bond challenge, and this bond challenge is uh, countries decide to to pledge to expand their their forest, that is planting more trees. So Labura is not only uh, concerned about protecting or reserving a forest and biodiversity, we are also concerned about expanding our forest, that is planting more trees. So there are, other, there are other NGOs around um, Liberia, like like my NGO, we just uh, embark on on a reforestation uh, process that is planting one billion trees in Liberia for now to 2030. So you can see that there are a lot of other NGOs in Liberia and government trying to embark on tree planting process. But I think what Clara said is that we have to protect what we have currently, and then before talking about uh, expanding on uh, forest conservation. Jonathan, did you also raise your hand to answer that question? Yeah, I am. Um, to add to what Ezekiel has just said, I think there are a lot of efforts that are being put in place by NGOs um, and the government itself in Liberia. Um, I think there's this um, women guard, women forest guard, I think so. These people are out to protect the illegal intrusion and, and unnecessary activities that are being carried out in the forest. And by doing so is an extensive effort towards, you know, reserving and protecting the already, already existing forest. And there are a good number of non-governmental organizations that are embarking on you know a campaign of planting trees so that they can widen the the the, the level of you know you know grown up trees in liberia which i think is another effort towards growing and extending the already existing forests that they have in liberia Thank you, Jonathan. Does anybody else want to add to that? If not, we have some more questions. Okay. Uh, this one says, has Vesta done any olivine green sand beaches in Liberia? Uh, go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, I can go ahead and address this one. I quickly looked at an article and it said as of May 29th, 2020, um, it looks like Project Vesta is in the Caribbean um, doing all of their work. So I'm not quite sure if they're in Liberia just yet. It sounds like, you know, as of right now, they're in the Caribbean, um, but we can also do, you know, more research and stay updated on that. I'll also send the link in the chat to where I found that information from. Um, so I hope that answered your question there. Um, and then the next question is, does the UN have any special programs to address countries like Liberia who have seen more impacts from climate change, even though they have contributed very little to it? Anyone want to take a stab at that question? <laughs> I can go ahead and take a stab at it. Um, in the program, we looked a lot at... Oh, Ezekiel, do you want to go for it as well? You can go first. Are you, 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 can, you can go ahead first and I will back you up. 
Okay, awesome. So in the program, we looked a lot at the European Green Deal. Um, and like a large part of that deal is helping out developing countries with their mitigation and adaptation efforts. Um, so they do have programming, but of course there's always more room for restoration help as well within developing countries like Liberia. Um, but there are like agreements like the Paris Climate Agreement, and then again, the European Green Deal that address helping out developing countries. But also I'll emphasize again, we need more restoration policies. And then Ezekiel, did you wanna add? Yeah, uh, thank you. So I, I think I think uh, the UN is doing something in Liberia, like the establishment, uh, supporting the establishment of the environmental studies and climate change program in Liberia, like I mentioned previously. But I believe personally, this is my own opinion. I believe that there's still a lot to be done. I think Liberia needs more support than we have now because uh, we are at the edge of being wiped away. Uh, looking at Liberia being on the west coast of Africa. So I think that, that there's much attention needs to be drawn to Liberia, protecting our coastal defense. And I think also supporting more uh, community-based NGOs and other local groups so that we can actually fight uh, climate change in Liberia more. So I think we need more support than what we have now. Thank you so much for all of that wonderful insight. Um, I also just wanted to mention that we are at time, but we are happy to stay on after to answer the rest of these questions. So just to be respectful of your time, um, if any of the participants would like to leave now, that is fine. But if you'd like to stay and continue to hear us answer all of your questions, um, then we're gonna continue with the Q&A. So next question is, does more biodiversity mean that ecosystems store more carbon? Go ahead, Catherine. Uh, yes, so basically it does because thanks to the diversity that they have, uh, it means that they have more complex, complex ecosystems, sorry. So that's why it's really important to protect hotspots because they regulate different ecosystem services like carbon capture, so yes. Yeah, go ahead, Claire, if you'd like to add. Yeah, I'd just like to add on to Catherine's. I completely agree. I think biodiversity does like increase the amount of carbon we can sequester. It also provides more stability within the ecosystems. So if conditions change a little and like say some plants aren't able to survive, there are others that will be able to survive. And so it kind of acts as a defense too to protect against these changing conditions. Would anybody else like to add to that question? Okay, uh, next question is, does the carbon absorbed by forests count toward getting to carbon neutral or is carbon neutrality just based on emissions? I could go ahead and start us off on this one. Um, I think, trees and you know the sequestration that's done by trees will continue on after we reach our carbon neutral goals um so then after that point we'll count towards climate restoration and start to lean towards carbon negative after we pass the carbon neutral goals um, however we learned a lot about tree planting in this program and the pros and cons that can come with that um, specific strategy and would anyone else like to share what we learned about like tree planting and you know the pros and cons of that? Not, I can I can go on about the tree planting. Um, oh, Catherine, did you want to take a stab at it? Uh, yeah. Well, the pros and cons with tree planting it's that basically it takes a long time for the trees to develop. So during this time, they can be susceptible to different uh, actions, like for example, uh, deforestation, animals, floodings. So that's the cons of tree planting basically, but still they are like the perfect example of, of carbon capture. So it's regarding time mostly. 
yeah, uh, let me just uh, add mine as well. So we believe that tree planting is, is a very good step, but not the best one to use because uh, it entails a lot of resources. We have to invest a lot of financing into that project, the more capacity we also to be done. So I believe that um, it is not the best among climate restoration uh, strategies, but uh, it takes very long time as well. The tree has to mature uh, before absorbing. And what it's gonna do is just absorb uh, the nature that we, we are implanted into the atmosphere, but it doesn't address the lingering carbon. So uh, climate restoration is all about we address the lingering carbon that is currently within the atmosphere. So and tree planting process doesn't do, doesn't do that. So I think it is not the best uh, strategy to use, but it also helps a lot. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to add to that and talk any more about tree planting? Oh, go ahead, Jonathan. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, tree planting is also one of the, you know, one of the, um, you know, primary restoration strategies anyway, but, you know, it takes long time. Like if you look at it from like, for instance, in well, Africa, where we are currently here, you know, for us to like have a tree planted and to get to a level whereby it could be able to sequester a lot of carbon that are already lingering in the atmosphere, you know, it takes a lot of years for the trees to grow. And aside that, being from the nursery stage, they are always exposed to a lot of environmental circumstances. You know, you have to do a lot of effort in order to protect them to eat, most especially when it comes to irrigation, you have to water them to ensure that they grow well. And uh, like in climate restoration, we have a goal, as in there is a particular estimated period that we hope that, you know, we restore our climate back to the pre-industrial levels, which was 217 parts per million. And uh, this is hoped to be achieved by 2050. Now, if we are to go by tree planting, though we said is it takes long period, there is that tendency that, you know, before we get to the 2050, we might not be uh, really get um, a lot of carbons that are already in the atmosphere being sequestered. So. It's a, it's a good way, Sha, but it's, it takes a lot of period or a longer period for trees to grow. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, any last comments? If not, we can move on to the next question. Okay. Uh, this next question says, there's been a major global youth movement for climate justice in the last few years. Since 65% of Liberia's population is youth, has there been a major youth movement for climate restoration in Liberia? All right, uh, I will go in to address that. And uh, yeah, we have 65% uh, of the population of Liberia youth. Vote. And I believe that we have few, few youth movements that are addressing the issue of climate change. But uh, many of the youth in Liberia uh, don't have knowledge on climate change. So we have a, a serious issue of uh, climate education. And also when we come to climate restoration, as well, I, I got introduced to this, to this program. So now that I have idea on climate restoration, it means that uh, I'll be one of those that will increase the movement of climate restoration in Liberia. And there's no specific group in Liberia. Done. I think Ezekiel cut out on us there at the end, um, but I really appreciate what he was saying as there's a need for um, climate literacy um, and education about the climate in Liberia so that the youth in Liberia can really catalyze and you know advocate for climate restoration and climate advocacy.
Okay, I'm not sure when Ezekiel will join us again, but when he does, maybe if he needs to add something, we'll come back to this question. Uh, but our next question, which I'm sure actually would be perfect for Ashley to answer, are what activities will the current cohort be taking at the completion of their program, future training, speaking opportunities, et cetera? Yeah, great question. So I see you want to stay engaged with us and see our youth. We definitely want you to as well. So that's why we have like a lot of things that they will be participating in in the next few weeks and after the program. So in the next few weeks, they they will be taking on leadership projects um, where they can engage with climate advocacy in their own ways. And it'll be a really hands-on type of experience, whether they choose to do a video or a poem or writing or journalism, like whatever they set their minds to in their leadership project, they're going to um, complete that in the next few weeks. So you'll be seeing a lot of that from us. We'll promote all of their projects on our platforms. So make sure that you follow the program social media accounts and also the foundation's social media accounts. Um, so you can expect that. And then after the program, um, they'll have an opportunity to take ones like some management roles and some other roles in the program, helping us run these events, helping us reach out to youth, helping us engage with you all more. So um, they're definitely not going anywhere if they so choose to uh, stay engaged with the program. There's so many places and opportunities where they can do that. Um, so thank you for that question. And we definitely, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. So don't worry. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a couple more questions. Uh, this one is more about like uh, restoration efforts in Liberia. So are there any plans to use the ocean off Liberia's coast to capture CO2, such as kelp farming or seaweed farming? Yeah, um, off of a quick Google search, it doesn't look like um, there's much of an emphasis on like the ocean restoration technologies. Um, I would say that Liberia has a better focus on a lot of the policies that Catherine talked about and our other youth talked about some other strategies and um, different focuses that they have as of right now. But um, I think we can definitely expect them to branch out towards the ocean restoration strategies within the next few years, maybe. Yeah, I would, and if anyone has. I would second Ashley's point when I was doing my research, not a ton came up about ocean um, policies regarding climate restoration or adaptation. It was mostly on land, um, focusing on things that were a little bit closer to home before they tackle using the ocean. Um, but in the future, I would assume it will be moving in that direction, like Ashley said earlier. Uh, thank you so much. Does anybody else have anything to add, any extra information? Uh, if not, then I think we're on to our last question, unless anybody wants to type something in the Q&A function super fast. But we do have a question about, do we know what country will be featured next month? Yeah, so we do not know because each cohort votes on the country that they want to present on. So the youth in this cohort um, voted on Liberia. They had like a, a majority vote. So um, it depends. Whatever country cohort two wants to present on, they will present on. And um, we'll do a better job of reaching out and letting you know the month ahead of time. Not the month, the country ahead of time so that you all can be excited about what we're presenting next. Awesome, and I think that was all of the questions. We received so many great questions. Oh, someone raised their hand. Um, I've allowed them to talk. Hi, hi, I just wanted to say to you, Ashley, and to all of, this, all of the cohort, all the people that spoke, great job. That's all, great job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I know I and all of the youth really appreciate it. Um, but yes, so it looks like we've answered all of the questions. Um, if you all have any more questions, feel free to email our program account, the foundation's account, reach out to us on social media. Um, we hope you enjoyed our event today and we hope you all have a lovely, lovely rest of your weekend. 
um, and see you all next month for our next World Tour event. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thank you, everyone. Thank you Great. so much. Great job, Brooke and Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy it.